Brooks Running has a new shoe for you runners out there. Did you hear that? Better turn up your volume. In fact, turn it up to the max. Introducing the all-new Ghost Max. It's got all kinds of things to make your knees and ankles feel protected, like Max Cushion, Max Soft Landings with DNA Loft V2 Foam, and Max Smooth Rides with their Glide Roll Rocker. Feel better on your run with Ghost Max. Learn more at brooksrunning.com. This is a Rogue Media Network podcast. Coming up on the payoff, this is actually, in a weird way, one of the grandfathers of this podcast. Mark Sapelsa is a news anchor, or he was a news anchor in Chicago for 25 years, more than 25 years before retiring a couple years ago. Uh, he's been in the news business for, for decades, for longer than that. He made a name as an investigative reporter. We're talking about, you know, knocking on the doors of union bosses in Chicago, really sticking his nose in it and mixing it up and doing the right things for the people of Chicago and, uh, you know, the markets he was in before that. Finally, he did the right thing for himself and his family and his wife by getting sober, but it didn't, didn't happen overnight. And this is a great example of a very high-functioning individual who could not beat alcoholism and his journey into recovery and on the other side of it is inspiring. He's obviously a broadcaster by trade. So he's super just compelling, uh, informative and entertaining to listen to. And he's a guy who I've literally read. I remember when he got sober in 2012 was before I even got into TV news. And, uh, he was very inspirational and I have had always been circling him. And finally, um, I, I reached out to him and we made this happen. So, uh, Mark Sapelsa is the man, and uh, he's a legend in Chicago and, and a legend in TV news. And, uh, you know, I, I, I told him this was probably the biggest story of his life, what he's doing in recovery. You want to talk about a big story? We got Kevin Souza. Mark Sapelsa. Pete. <laughs> What's up, man? How you doing? Good. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Thank you so much for taking the time. No problem. Is, is this a good connection here? Uh, honestly, I've been doing this for almost a year. Mike, the producer, would you say it's the best we've had? Yeah, it really is one of the best connections. How you doing? Yeah. Good, good. All right, so Mark, it's just going to be Mike uh, and myself. And uh, the way it'll work is that I'll give an intro and then we'll just go right into this interview uh, Great. on the that's podcast. That's so we can just start now. Mike, by the way, I came in and noticed he's the only person. People gain weight over the holidays. Mike is losing weight, uh, <laughs> which is good, which is good for him. But you know why he's losing weight? Because you stopped drinking, right, Mike? That's exactly right. Yeah, about 50 pounds have dropped off. Wow. Yeah. Look at that. That's great. Yeah, I keep looking at it. <laughs> uh, so, nice Mark, to meet you. yeah, man, I, I just wanted to get started, but there's there's so much, you know. For me, the idea behind this podcast is to talk about recovery and basically the great life on the other side of addiction. Uh, a lot of people, myself included, before I got sober, I thought, you know, how am I going to live? How is it going to be fun? Uh, and you just, for me, I just kept myself in this terrible cycle. Uh, of, of addiction and, and alcoholism. But I say that to, to also say that I'm, I'm curious about your career. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to ask you certain sure. things about that too. I, you were in Chicago doing the news for, for 25 years, more than 25. Yeah. I got, uh, got to, got back home to Chicago in 93. So yeah, I think it was, let me see if I add it up right. It's about, yeah, 25 years, 25 years. And you, so you're from Chicago. Yeah, I was born in Milwaukee, uh, which is why I'm a uh, uh, undying Lombardi era Bart Starr Packer fan. Oh, <laughs> really? I was talking with somebody last night about about the Ice Bowl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you remember Dick Kay from uh, Channel Five back in the day. Yes. Who's uh, passed away in the last year or so? He covered it. He was standing like in a trench coat on the roof of Lambeau covering that thing, and he he still had his old ticket from that day. And I'm like, oh, I was only like five years old but i would have loved to have been there anyway yeah and that's but, we, yeah, we then, could we could see a rematch of that this year in the nfc championship that's how the conversation i was having came up but so you grew up in chicago and right you grew up a cubs fan i was you know just reading about you a little bit your personal life you grew up going to cubs games 
with your yep. dad. Sounds like a, a, a really fulfilling, picturesque childhood. You know, there was nothing to complain about in my childhood whatsoever. It was a, it was a classic suburban Chicago childhood. My dad and mom were there. Uh, they were, you know, loving and attentive. Uh, we never wanted for anything. And yeah, even, even in, uh, even in those days of going to Wrigley Field, I would ask my dad if I could bring my trumpet to play charge. <laughs> da, 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 da. And I, you know, if I think if I took my, I took my kids to ball games too. And if, I think if one of them asked to bring a trumpet, I would say, well, first of all, security probably won't let us these days, but no, you're not going to, you know, blast charge in my ear. My dad said, sure, bring it along. And back in those days, for example, at Wrigley, you had 5,000 fans, even on a Saturday. I mean, you know, it, it just, they just didn't draw. And so we could spread out and I was, you know, loving every minute of it with my dad. And he, he let me play charge and run around the aisles and the whole bit, you know, the Andy Frey and was like, Oh, cute kid. Now I'd be like, sit down kid or you're kicked out. <laughs> but uh, anyway, yes, it, it was, it was a, it was a wonderful childhood. There's no question about it. And uh, it had um, little to do, I think with my alcoholism, other than the fact that I probably have it in my genes. Yeah, is there any alcoholism in your family that you're aware of? Yes, absolutely. Um, I would say it's very possible that my, you know, my, my parents had some alcohol issues, but they never really showed it. Uh, they sort of hid it well, put it that way. My dad was a big man. He was about six foot five. He was a, a college athlete. And, uh, you know, later in years, he probably weighed 240. And so he, he could put away, a, you know, a, a fifth of uh, whiskey in, uh, you know, a couple of nights and barely even show it. And so I think I just mimicked that. And then it wasn't until later in life, in fact, about three years ago, that I was up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and I was going to the funeral of my godmother, who was about 80 years old, on my dad's side. And uh, one of my aunts up there said, you know, you're, um, we're going to bury your, your uh, godmother here in, in the cemetery up here in Calumet, Michigan, right next to your great-grandfather and your great-grandmother who came from Italy in 19 in 1894, your great grandfather died at age 52. And everyone talked about in the family lore that, Oh, it's because he worked in the copper mines of upper Michigan and uh, he got chemicals on his hands and he was in such pain. That's a lie. He was an alcoholic. He killed himself. I think he probably put a bullet in his head, Okay, but he, but he definitely was drinking himself to death. And I was like, you're kidding me. So it's in our genes. You know, and then my grandfather wasn't on that side, so it kind of skipped a couple of generations, I guess. My brother and sister, they're not alcoholics. Now, does that, rel I, does that relative ask you that question, you think, because you've come out there with your, with your sobriety? Like, you've kind of opened these channels of communication? Sure, yeah. She, she, my, my aunt, who's sweet as heck, said, uh, I'm proud of you for going to treatment. And then she proceeded to say, you know, it might be in the family. Here's what happened to your great-grandfather. And I, I was like, thank you for telling me that. Seriously, I you know I had no clue. Yeah, it takes a little thought, bit of a weight off. Yeah, I thought, oh, I'm I'm just a black sheep here, but I, I I kind of think that you know both my parents probably had some sort of drinking issue that they just didn't again didn't show it the way I was exhibiting it. You know, my my lifestyle was uh, from college. Um, I, what what human being remembers their first beer? Well, only an alcoholic. Yeah, I remember my first. <laughs> you know, at, at age like sixteen. I was an athlete in high school, so we, we shouldn't have drank. We couldn't really drink to stay in shape. But then I, toward the end of my uh, uh, maybe junior or beginning of senior year, I was like, I'm going to some weekend parties. And I remember my first beer going like, holy mackerel, this gives me the confidence to talk to girls and yeah. blah, blah, blah. And from then on, I was kind of like, work hard, play hard. And that was my motto. And that was an excuse. I didn't realize it, but that was my excuse. College. There was some, uh, you know, I, I, I talk about it in my, uh, you know, with my fellow recovering alcoholic colleagues. There were some beautiful uh, women that I wanted to date, but they wouldn't touch me because they saw what I was doing in bars, hanging from rafters and trying to be the funny guy and and, uh, and overdoing it. And they were like, I don't, you you party too hard, man. And back then it was like, you party too hard. You party hard. I'm like, yeah, that's a badge of honor. And what they were basically telling me is, you're a drunk, but. Um, I kind of managed myself nine to five Monday through Friday. So when I got my first job in television in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, right after I went to Marquette University in 1980, 
four. You know, Monday through Thursday, I didn't touch a drop. And this is in green. This is in green. When you got your first job at Green in Green Bay. Yep. Okay. Yep. First reporting job. And so Monday through Thursday, I was like the hermit, and people were like, "God, you're quiet. You just you're focused on your job. And you ever like you ever have any fun?" And then eventually they saw me have fun. You know, Friday and Saturday nights when I eventually got a little comfortable in the job, I let it loose, and then I was I was the lead partier. And again, I saw it as a badge of honor, but I was just, I was drinking massively on the weekend and then button it up on Monday. It's, it's just to jump in real quick. I want to, I want to go backwards a little bit because if somebody were to look at your, your life and your career, uh, it's be, you're beyond functional as an alcoholic, uh, yeah. you, you, you know, extreme success, you know, like I mentioned almost three decades on the air in Chicago. And we're talking about, you ended up with WGN, which is almost like a national network. I grew up myself you know, watching Bozo into the Cubs as a kid. Uh, right. And I was, I'm from right. Philly. I was a Phillies fan. But, you know, I remember Steve Stone and Harry Carey doing those day games for me coming home from, you know, Catholic grade school. It was awesome. I mean, it was, it was sports right. on during the day. Uh, it was a complete celebration. And so you're on WG, <laughs> you're what was. So you're on WGN. Your your life seems so fulfilling or so fulfilled and successful. But you mentioned back when you started to drink, did you lose anything, Mark? Like, for instance, I always say when I drank, I was I was really into sports. I had all kinds of goals. But the moment I drank, that was my number one focus. Uh, and I didn't even know it. It was subconsciously my number one focus. And, you know, that and kind of girls and partying. Did, did you lose anything or did you notice a shift? Well, I think I think what it was for me was that it was my reward. I felt like it was my reward after working my tail off and, uh, you know, on my – job and you know I, I still played basketball for workouts I you know I, I ran I was a runner in high school uh, basketball player in high school baseball player in high school so so I you know we had a softball team my first job in Green Bay I started uh, uh, you know a, uh, a morning basketball gathering for uh, we reporters and anchors in Minneapolis which is my second stop after Green Bay did the same thing in Chicago so I kind of like I worked out I worked hard on my job. I was a good husband. I was a family man, you know, this. And so it was kind of like me time when it came to drinking. So it wasn't like I was lost my mind, so to speak. Uh, like, okay, now the number one focus is drinking. It was more like I deserve this. So I'm going to have this and nobody's going to stop me. And for the, for, I, I would say for the first two decades of drinking, like twenties and thirties, I was pretty much, in enough control that nobody really knew that I had a problem. They knew I was a heavy party or a hard partier, but, the, it, but I, I really, unless they were not telling me straight to my face, it was more like, dude, you're fun. Yeah. And so I, I had no clue. My subconscious was, I'm just a, I'm just a fun partier. And then I'm a serious guy when I go to work. So my focus was really, uh, climb that ladder of my career. My dad kind of raised the bar for, you know, his, his career and his, you know, the things that he accomplished in life. So I kind of, what did he do? That. He, by age 12 or 13 was teaching music. Uh, he, he was, he was teaching accordion at age 13 <laughs> and that, and that was paying for his, his first car. And then he became, then he picked up basketball. He's six foot five by the time he was 15, picked up basketball, got a scholarship at Marquette. Oh, wow. He was the best, best player in the state of Wisconsin in high school uh, by his senior year. And so he was captain of Marquette when they played uh, Kansas in 1958. He played against, he literally guarded Will Chamberlain in the NCAA tournament, scored six points over him. He said, oh, I did it with my eyes closed because the guy was too big. <laughs> um, you know, he said that he, Chamberlain, Chamberlain dominated us, but I, I did okay against him. And then he went on to have a, a fabulous career in the oil industry with uh, Union Oil, U Union 76, and eventually owned a couple of his own truck stops. And by the time he was, you know, uh, 45 he was he was wealthy put it that way okay uh, and and so uh he didn't die wealthy uh because the, the the truck stop competition became so great that he was when, when he passed away that we had to sell the truck stops at a loss and all that sort of stuff so there was there was no inheritance put it that way but the bottom line is he had a good career and he was he was the you know he'd walk into a restaurant and everybody knew who he was and he'd put his arm around the waitress and say, "Hi, oh, good to see you again." And the chef would come out, and so he was this bigger than life image. Uh, and as my 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 sister calls him as a dad, he was the goat. You know, he was the greatest of all time. Uh -huh. 
So I had to, I had this image to live up to. So I tried and tried and tried, and that's probably what spurned me to work my tail off, but be stressed about it. And so I think I burned off the stress by drinking at night. And then eventually, by the time I was in my 40s, I realized, you know, drinking and driving was dangerous, stupid, and could be costing me my career. So I kind of huddled at night down in the basement in my own little office, pretending like I was doing some work, maybe maybe doing some work, doing bills, email, this and that. My wife would say, hey, you going to come to bed? I said, yeah, I'll be up there in about a you know, half hour or so, honey. She'd fall asleep and I'd keep drinking. Yeah. And that's how my that's how my pattern went until I was fifty when I finally went to treatment, realized I needed help. It turned into for me, I couldn't stop once I started. So only thing that would stop me was at three in the morning, like, holy crap, I gotta get up and interview Mayor Emanuel at eight o'clock in the morning for yeah. a project I'm working on. I better go to bed. That was the only thing that would force me. Otherwise, I might have stayed up till six in the morning, gotten up at nine or ten taken a three mile run to clear my head, showered up, go to work. You mentioned the, the, the running, right? Becomes a part of it. I was kind of the same way. Uh, I would always run to kind of clear my head, get rid of the hangover. And then right. you could work a little bit and then you could justify the drinking after, after a day of work and after, after a workout in the morning, it was just kind of, it all made sense. And, and, and you do feel better after a run. I mean, it does kind of break, break the hangover yeah. or, or whatever I, it is. I want, it's funny. You mentioned, you know, I, you had some great hard hitting uh, news stories. And when you mentioned your dad and the truck stop business and you know, the competition, I I could ask you for days about that, about exactly how we got, how that got pushed out or whatever. I'm sure you have some, (laughs) I'm sure you have some being in Chicago. I'm sure you have some interesting opinions there um, or stories there, but what was, what was your biggest story? You know, that's a really, that's a good question. I've, I've been asked like, what was your most, like your favorite story? I, we did, uh, Marsha Bartell was my uh, investigative producer. I, I learned how to dig to the next level from her. She was at Channel 5 back in the early 90s when I got to Channel 5. The end, that was the NBC Apple. affiliate, right? Yep, exactly, oh. WMAQ. And uh, she sort of taught me, and Dave Savini, who's at Channel 2 right now, CBS 2 uh, in Chicago, sort of taught us how to – dig deeper on, on, on stories that we were interested in. And so I recruited her when I was at WFLD Fox Chicago in 2000 and uh, I want to say five or so, and then recruited her over at WGN. So we worked probably 15 years together. And, um, uh, I would, there, there were too many stories to really name one, but I would say, here's the deal. I, we probably won, not that awards are the, the, the be all end all, but we probably, I threw away, literally threw away about 14 Emmys in my, in, in the uh, garbage can of the alley in Evanston where we live when we finally picked up and moved to Chicago, moved to Montana. And uh, when I, after I retired, my wife was like, what are you doing? I said, I don't need every one of those anymore. I took pictures of them. I'm happy with them. I'm proud of them. Marsha and I did great work together, but I kept one and it, w- it had to do with pensions being abused in the city of Chicago by a uh, union guy. I just watched that, the story yesterday. It was unbelievable. Yeah. yeah and it, it was kind of a multi-part thing that we did. We, we came up, it was our sources that gave us the story. And then we called the Tribune because we were affiliates with them with WGN. And we, we came up with, we found a, a excellent report of the Tribune who worked with us. And we kind of did a, a tandem thing. And we found guys that were like, let's, let's say, for example, they were garbage truck drivers first. Then they were moved up to the one. The, the one guy was a, was a steamroller. That's how he started out. Yes, exactly right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh huh. And then and then eventually they became head of the union. And then eventually they became the negotiator for the union. So they they would basically draw like three different pensions when they shouldn't have been. They should have melded them into one. So this so the taxpayer wouldn't get screwed by somebody cheating on three different pensions. And we caught them doing it. And I'm not sure that it ever solved the issue because there were ways to kind of get around things, but it was a long and laborious time doing that in which we exposed a number of fat cats, so to speak, that were uh, tearing into the, uh, the public dole and should not have been. So it was a complicated story, but we were proud of it because we caught people red handed. You did catch people red handed. The one guy, I guess his pension was like $160,000 and this is back, I don't know, in the nineties. Right. And he, uh, 
is like five million yeah. over over the, right. that you get, yeah uh-huh. exactly exactly. So uh, where do you get? Uh, and we'll get back to the alcoholism, but this all kind of wraps uh, wraps in together because for me it's kind of mind blowing. The courage that in the the, the balls, uh, part of my language, it takes to do a story like that. I mean, for people that don't know, you know, anybody listening to this is trying to figure out about recovery, whether they're an alcoholic or not, or maybe they're just listening to this for a meeting. But you know, Mark was. You mentioned you were, it finished up as an anchor, uh, but you know you were an investigative reporter. That was kind of in your bones, right. and you're knocking on doors constantly, uh, you know, right. unannounced, right? <laughs> and back in yes, the day, oftentimes, oftentimes, yes. and you're doing stories on you know alleged mob bosses and, and union guys. Sure. Where do you get the the, the the courage to do that? Well, you you kind of you kind of don't uh, put it this way you're a little nervous or a little scared every time you're starting a process like that. Uh, but in the back of your head is I'm doing this for the good of the public. I'm doing this for the good of a, of a well-told story. It's my job. And so the point being in the beginning, there were times, I mean, I had producers say, Hey man, you're, you're sounding too scared when you're asking questions, you know, don't be afraid of them. You know, I, I had producers tell me that and I'd be like, they would play back the tape and I'd say, you're right. I got to buck up a little tougher or I got to, I've got to be a little uh, quicker with my questions or not as, not as lengthy with my questions, get to the point and dig in. And so what would often happen is we as a crew, a TV crew would get into a, an unmarked van and we would head to our, wherever we were going to confront whoever we were confronting. You know, I would I would have to kind of just self-talk my way. Okay, get ready. Here we go. And then we literally would jump out of a van sometimes because some, oftentimes the best way to catch somebody who didn't want to talk to you was in the morning when they were leaving their house. We wouldn't trespass, but we would wait until they get like back out of their driveway, get on the street on a public, you know, public uh, piece of property. And then we would walk up to them. And we were told we were scumbags. We were vultures we were whatever uh but we knew that we had something and so i think when somebody pushed back on us it made you kind of push a little harder saying well wait a minute you're hiding something and you're cheating the public and the public needs to know this and so your fear would drop almost like i would imagine it's like being on a football field and here you go it's a big playoff game and you're set for the kickoff and after that first hit your nerves go away. Okay. Yeah. And it was kind of the same way. You, you jump, jump out of the car with a microphone and you, you, you know, blast somebody with a, you know, excuse me, sir. I understand that you're cheating on this, or I understand you did this. I believe you did this. Is that true? And after your first question and the first answer, whether it be a F you get out of my face or I don't want to talk to you, then your nerves would drop. But there's no question. I had some sleepless nights preparing for what was going on the next day. Was there any contentious, exchange that people in Chicago remember or that you'll never forget a particular one? <laughs> uh, actually, this had nothing to do with investigative stuff, but uh, I'm not sure there's video anymore because it, it was back early on. But I had a, uh, a one-on-one with Jerry Springer uh, in <laughs> on Channel 5 in 1990. It might have been 7. And um, uh, that's it, it was kind of an historic moment on television at the time because Jerry Springer came on to Channel 5, hired by our management, to be a commentator. And Jerry lasted about three days doing commentary uh, because the heat got so bad. They hired him to force Ron Majors and Carol Marine to actually quit in protest. And Carol first did. Uh, and those are, those, and are two, those are two reporters or anchors? They were the two main anchors okay, okay. at Channel 5 at the time, probably number one in, in the uh, in the. Uh, in the market at the time, but the management didn't like them because they had too much power. Uh, and so yeah. Jerry came on and basically mocked Carol Marine, the, the lead anchor woman as being a high priestess of journalism. And so he and I went at it finger pointing in the whole bit for about five minutes on television. And uh, it, it kind of became the, uh, the buzz of, <laughs> uh, of the community for, uh, for a, a number of months. Then that was one of them. There was another one where we had uh, the former um, Cook County assessor, Joe Berrios. We waited for him 
outside of Cook, Cook, Cook County, at, basically the Chicago area. Yeah. Assessor, yeah, exactly, exactly. And we were outside of Gene and Giorgetti's, one of the famous steak joints downtown. And he came out what we believe was, it appeared to be having a few too many drinks at midnight. And we were getting him on a number of things that we had in his job. But we also asked him why he was getting into his car after being at Gene and Giorgetti's drinking all night. And uh, that was a, that was kind of a, a fun, unusual, and uh, put it this way, colorful exchange at midnight on the streets of Chicago. And that's the kind, that, that was the kind of classic stuff we had to do is sit there and wait for hours. And sometimes you came up empty, and sometimes you hit the jackpot. We'll get back to this conversation in a second. But right now, a word from our sponsors. Brooks Running has a new shoe for you runners out there. Did you hear that? Better turn up your volume. In fact, turn it up to the max. Introducing the all-new Ghost Max. It's got all kinds of things to make your knees and ankles feel protected, like Max Cushion, Max Soft Landings with DNA Loft V2 Foam, and Max Smooth Rides with their Glide Roll Rocker. Feel better on your run with Ghost Max. Learn more at brooksrunning.com. So, so now you're hitting the jackpot career-wise. Uh, you're, you're revered in Chicago, which, by the way, you know, it's weird to be in big cities now, I think, just because we're coming, you know, the pandemic and all that stuff. But Chicago was probably never hotter, you know, in the 90s, the Bulls, all, all, all that right. great stuff. And you're, you're, you're a, a man about town, but you're kind of living a lie as we get back to the, to the alcoholism. Or, or are you? You tell me. Did it feel like you oh, were yeah. living a lie? Sure, sure. You know, I didn't really know I was living the lie until, you know, at my, I think I realized at some point that I like to go out afterward or go home quickly. Um, and, you know, in fact, sometimes I would, I would drive home Lakeshore Drive on a summer night with uh, my little convertible top down and I'd have a red solo cup in the car. And you know what I had in there was, you know, either a wine or a uh, martini or whatever that I would mix in the bait in the garage of work when nobody was looking from my trunk. And I would sip it on the way home and drive about 45 miles an hour on Lakeshore Drive on a beautiful night. And by the time I got home, you know, hopefully uh, the kids were in bed. My wife took care of that, blah, blah, blah. And I would, you know, just sneak my, so that was living a lie. No question about it. And then when I stopped doing that, because I was afraid I was going to get caught dr- drinking and driving, got, you know, guys would say, Hey, want to go out? Uh, blah, 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 blah. And I would say, nah, I, I got to get up early tomorrow, you know, for this and that and the other thing. No, I was living a lie because I was going straight home and finding my way down to the, uh, the basement office there and uh, light myself, you know, I used to call it a party for one at, you know, 1130 at night until however late I could stand it before I had to go to bed quickly to get up and, and start the next day. And so I think I really realized I was living the lie when probably the last three years before I went to treatment and then the final night was May 3rd, uh, 2012. And I made a mistake. I was covering my tracks every night and I made a mistake and I uh, uh, was out on the patio with a cigar and probably two bottles of wine out there Had a third bottle of wine going inside. I came inside and the house and I accidentally, uh, you know how you set an alarm, like an ADT alarm and it goes, Uh well, I set that alarm and my wife heard it and she thought maybe the alarm was going off and she looked at the clock and three in the morning and she thought I was in bed. So she reaches over for me. I'm not there. She comes running downstairs saying, I think somebody's breaking in. And no, it was me setting the alarm and I sat in the chair and I fell right to sleep before she came down. So that's how pat, that's how drunk I was. Yeah. And she shakes me and says, Hey, the alarm, I think there's the alarm went off. What are you doing down here? She had no idea. I was hiding my the bottles. I was hiding everything. You yeah, know how well and did you said, hide what? it from her? I would say when it really got heavy the last three years, you know, I there were times I got caught here and there, like like we would be at our here in Montana at our our cabin where we now live, but we would come here for vacation and, you know, like let's say summer or or, or Christmas holiday vacation, and she'd say, "Man, that wine went straight to your head. How much have you had to drink?" You know, she'd have. <laughs> Because you were hiding it, right? Different bottles everywhere. Oh, yeah. Oh, I had them everywhere. And so I would run downstairs to put, like, hey, I'm going to go put water in the Christmas tree downstairs. Well, no, I'd put water in the Christmas tree, and then I'd put, a, you know, another drink in my tumbler, and I'd come back upstairs, and I, I would uh, – she had no idea. I'd hidden here, hidden here, hidden there. 
And every once in a while I'd overdo it and I'd get caught and, and I'd say, yeah, you know, I, I just, I think I didn't eat enough. I would have some lame excuse. She would kind of say, well, be careful, but you know, I don't want the kids to blah, blah, blah. And the kids said, when I went to treatment, they're like, yeah, we never, I, I think I saw you drunk once, maybe at like a birthday party of yours or something like that. And I was like, yeah, I used to hit it very well, kids. And, uh, you know, my wife saw it more than they did, uh, clearly, but she never really suspected that I was doing it late at night after work like that. I would, I would crawl into bed. I would have all kinds of sneaky ways the last couple of years. I'd crawl into bed. You know, we'd talk. We'd have a great conversation. And then as soon as I heard her breathing like she was falling asleep, I'd sneak out of bed, you know, and, and I would, uh, you know, maybe pretend like I was going to the bathroom, flush the toilet, make some noise, and then, boom, scoop downstairs and start my party. How, how, how did you, when did you realize you were losing control? I would say probably the last six months before I went to treatment at, when I was 50, uh, almost 50 and, uh, 2002. So yeah, I was, I was approaching, I was about a month away from 50. We went uh, for a Christmas vacation. Uh, we did something different. We used to go to our cabin here in Montana and ski and everything else. We did something different that year. We went to, uh, overseas or we went to Argentina, I think. Uh, with the family, just the two kids and my wife. And I had a moment with a taxi cab driver in Buenos Aires where, you know, we, we were going out to dinner and I jumped in the shower and I did my usual. I grabbed a couple of beers in the shower. Mm -hmm. So I'm getting lubed up while I'm shaving and, you know, this and that. So I'd had a couple on an empty stomach. And so by the time we got in the cab, I was feeling good. And we got in the cab, and we're driving. My kids could speak Spanish, and I could barely speak Spanish. So they were communicating with the taxi cab driver. And uh, he drives us about a mile and then says, tell me to my kids, tell me again, where, which restaurant? And then basically says, no, I can't go. I'm not going to go there. I have to let you off here. And I got pissed off. And I said, wait, what's he doing? And he said, oh, he can't drive that far to the restaurant, so he's letting us off here so we have to find another cab. And I was like, that's bullshit. And so I started kind of letting them have it in English. And my daughter squeezed my, my wife's leg and said, dad's making me nervous. What's going on here? And it was because I was, I'd had a few in me and she pulls me aside before we did get to the restaurant and said, you scared Ava in the taxi when you were yelling at the taxi driver. And I was like, yeah, that was kind of uncharacteristic of me. And I, I don't, I don't know why I'd lost a little control like that, but I was realizing that then, uh-oh, I think this is getting the best of me. I think this alcohol is getting the best of me. And my wife was beginning to tell me that I was becoming a little distant. And even before that, and then after that, and I realized then I only had a couple of months in me and I had to do something. Yeah. And I remember thinking, why, and as an alcoholic, you're thinking, why wouldn't I just stop then? I couldn't. Yeah. I didn't know how to stop. Yeah, I didn't understand the 12 step program. I didn't know what alcohol synonymous was. I, I knew nothing. I, I thought it was all a bunch of like, ah, that's for smoky old men who cigarettes and this and that. I don't know who's going to help me. I don't know how to do this. And so I just kept going. I, I get super grateful because, you know, my brother got sober before me. It's in my family like you. So I knew, I saw the change in him. I had a friend who got sober when we were real young. And there are a lot of people out there kind of walk in the path that you did they have no clue what this thing looks like the recovery thing you know the positivity of it uh right. you know it's great that people know that that you're sober today but you know some guys are just like you and they choose and it's their complete right right to, to stay anonymous people have no idea uh the superstars and the characters and, and the colorful guys and, and girls that are running around there sober you know um we, right. we, we just we just don't know Right. That's right. It's exactly right. And you said in the beginning of, of this podcast that your sobriety at the, at the point of, of getting sober, you were worried about having fun anymore. And, and no question about it. When I, that night, May 3rd, 2012, when my wife came down, when I actually set the alarm, you know, did it in and, and, and she said, Oh my God, have you been doing this long? I said, every night, every night for a long time. And she was embarrassed. And sad that she didn't know. I said, go take a look at the recycling bin underneath all the newspapers. And she opened them up, and there was a week's worth of bottles because our recycling would come every week out in, the, out in the back or out in the side of the house. And I had, I, I don't know how many bottles for about six days out, out there. And it was, you know, massive amounts that I was putting away and hiding underneath there. She came in crying saying, do you need help? And I, and I said, I think I do. And that was the first time I admitted it. First time. 
And I realized right then that I gave up my drinking card right then. I was like, Oh my God, three in the morning. Here I am. I'm kind of sobering up because I was shocked that I was caught and shocked that she was actually being, you know, she was being loving, but she was crying like, Oh my God, we're, this is falling apart. Are you okay? Do you need help? Oh my God. And I was like, yes, I, I think I do need help, but I don't know what to do. And, but I, in the back of my head, I said, Oh my God, I gave up my drinking card. I have a couple of ball games I was going to go to this weekend yeah. and it's going to be no fun or I got to cancel them. Oh no. Yeah. And that was a big worry of mine. X amount of months later, I realized I could still have a lot of fun and be sober, but it has taken me a fair, a fairly long time to realize this wasn't just a drinking disease. This is a thinking disease and that my thought process and my personal defects were my main issues not just the drinking. And I would drink to kind of hide my personal defects, my people pleasing, my stress over work, my, all those triggers that were like the way I handled stress or the way I handled anger, the way I handled even small things like little road rage issues, like, ah, oh, it's taking me forever to get to, get to work because of this traffic. You know, I would drink over those small things or how people treated me or how I treated them or I treated somebody at work poorly. Uh, because I was just an angry cuss that day. Uh, and I would feel badly about it. Instead of addressing it to them personally, one-on-one, I'd go home and drink about it and think, oh, I got I got to be a better person tomorrow. Did but you ever, did you ever skirt thing, any major consequences or have any major consequences? Um, well, basically my marriage survived and my family stayed together. And I, I consider that skirting <laughs> what could have been major consequences yeah. because, you know, I, you know, I, I was just, you know, neglectful as, you know, I remember my, my son being like, uh, when we were playing, uh, playing catch out in front when he was about 10 and I was just, my, I was hung over and my mind wasn't in it. And he was like, you know, dad, you know, what's, what's wrong with you today? And I, I, I can't remember if I was like maybe on my phone or I was, you know, whatever I was doing, I was just not being attentive. And I remember those moments that really burn inside you. Like, uh, I think my son was sick one time, uh, when he was about four and my wife said, Hey, on your way home from work, please get some NyQuil and some this and some that. And I was quietly sitting at a bar by myself mm. after work, slamming a few down. I was like, oh, yes, honey. I walked outside pretending like I wasn't in the bar. I was like, yeah, I'm just walking to my car at work. Yeah, be right home. Be, I'll be home in a little bit. It took me about an hour and a half to leave that bar. And my, my son was sick. <laughs> you know, and now I can look back and go, well, it was probably just a nasty cold. But the point was, I sat at that bar for an hour and a half when my son was sick. Yeah, you are an upper crust alcoholic with with a great job and a great family. But at the same time, we we share those same you know characteristics as as the bottom of the barrel drunk. You know, and, and that's right. You mentioned your wife saying you were distant. You know, it's the number one relationship in our life. At some point, that's it, right. It, it takes over and it cuts off yeah. cuts off relationships to you know spiritual relationships, relationships to our our wives, you know, our significant others, sure. our kids. I, I want to ask you, um, you know, I was lucky enough to have, I, I have public figures on here from time to time. And, uh, I was talking to, uh, to Ryan Leaf recently. And he, he mentioned that, you know, when he had to get sober or when he, he got in trouble, he suffered a consequence, you know, he was public. So it was public, yeah. you know, you, yeah. it was out there. I mean, you owned it that night, you know, on uh, May 3rd, 2012, you tell your wife, that's it. The jig is up. You tell her the truth. And how, how far away from that moment, is it to when you, you pack your bags and you head off to Hazelden in Minnesota? Oh, by the way, you're going back to Minnesota now, but you're going there for treatment. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, it was probably, I think that was a, that was a Wednesday or Thursday morning at three in the morning. And by the time Saturday rolled around, I was driving up to Hazelden with my whole family. So did car. you go to work the next day? Yeah. So I, what I did was on, on that Thursday, um, I called in sick, but I called my main bosses, my top three bosses, the general manager, uh, the news director and the assistant news director. And I said, um, I'm calling in sick, but I'm call but I want to meet you guys in your office. So I won't walk into the newsroom. Uh, I want, what's a good time. And they said, how about noon? And I said, everything's okay, but I'm calling in sick, but I have something I want to share with you. And so I, I typed up my letter to my colleagues and basically said, I am going to treat, because by that time we had uh, secured Hazelden, uh, 
and I was going to check in on that Saturday. So it was probably like a day and a half later. And I said in my letter, which Robert Feeder, the columnist, Chicago TV uh, critic columnist, uh, printed. I didn't give it to him, but I knew that uh, somebody would would you figured, probably yeah. sneak it to him, which which was just fine. I, I was okay with it. And I said I explained everything uh, as best I could. I said I I'm I'm going to treatment. I believe I've got a drinking problem. I've been hiding at night from my family for years, and I finally have to stop doing this, and it's affected my uh, relationships, my work, my this, my that. And uh, so I typed it up, and I sat down at the board, like the uh, board table of my general manager uh, with my news director right across from me and my general manager across from me. My assistant news director was not in the building at the time, couldn't be there, but um, I slid the papers across, my, my story across to them, and, and it was a, it was a one-pager, easy to read. I said, please read this. My general manager gets tears in her eyes, and my news director says, oh, my gosh, I thought you were a teetotaler. I had no idea. Wow. And I, I said, Greg, that's how, that's how hard I've tried to hide it. Uh, you know, I, I, I value my, my work and my relationships as best I possibly can, very close to my best. So I tried really hard to hide this, but I can't hide it any longer. And they said, do what you need to do. And I said, okay, take this letter, type it up in the computer, send it out to my, our, my colleagues. I know, I'm sure it'll go to, to Robert Feeder, so it'll be public soon. And it was within minutes, which is fine. Uh, I wanted to tell the story the way it really happened. I didn't want rumors and this and that. Because I, I, I consulted with uh, a very good friend of mine who also is 30 years in recovery, maybe more, Ron Majors, uh, one oh, wow. of the main anchors yep, at, uh, in Chicago, now retired as well. And it, Friday morning, I had breakfast with him. My, my wife actually suggested it, saying, why don't you, why don't you have a meeting with, with Ron? to see what he would say and do because he's been, he was in recovery 30 years before that and had been straight sober for that long. So he made some nice suggestions to me and he said, you don't have to tell anybody. You could just say you're going on assignment for a month. And I felt, and that was fine advice, but I felt like somebody was going to find out. And nobody would believe I'd be gone for a whole month. It was also the May ratings period and no anchors gone for the whole month of a ratings yeah. period. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to just lay it out there and tell people exactly what was going on. I was drinking at night, and I can't do it anymore. Um, and so I that was it. And it went to the colleagues, went to feeder, went public, and then I was gone for a month. And then I came back, and I just asked the bosses when I came back a month later, my first or second, first night on the job after treatment, said, do you mind if I just take 15, 20 seconds after Tom Skilling's weather and kind of explain on camera where I'd been, and who I am. So I just said, hi, I just want to reintroduce myself. I'm Mark and I'm, I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> no just, shit. Yep. And I, and I said it on the air and I said, I, I just came back from treatment and um, I'm hoping to start a new sober life. And I've been sober more than 35 days now. And um, thanks for your uh, patience. And I'm back and I'll never say anything about it again, but I just wanted to tell you that's where I've been. And so, you know, I had, I had some trolling online, like, Oh, you're a drunk. I always knew you were drunk or, you know, yeah. if they didn't like, if they didn't like the work I was doing or if I had, invest yeah, right. yeah. if I had investigated them, they <laughs> yeah. were getting me back online. Like, yeah, yeah you drunken asshole. But, uh, for the most part, it was, it was very, everybody was really supportive and it, it was, I, I found, uh, I found love, uh, from viewers and colleagues alike. Uh, well, a, a, and, uh, a lot to a lot to unpack just just from that right there. I got so yes. much, I got so much to ask you, but I'll ask you a couple of things that co come to the top of the mind. Sure. I grew up in Philadelphia, and I grew up, you know, uh, you know, in high school in the '90s and college, uh, you know, late '90s, 2000s, and uh, or should I just say late '90s? I don't want to, you know, I'm I, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm not that young. So, anyways, I. Basically, what I'm saying is anchors in Philadelphia, news people in Philadelphia, much like Chicago, they are the celebrities. I mean, this does not happen right. as often anymore. Just to give an idea to people that are listening to this and, and don't really have an idea what we're talking about. I mean, so you, there you are, one of the faces of celebrity in Chicago, you know, with the guys like Bill Curtis and Lester Holt um, that, that had come before you. And you're going to go to yeah. rehab and it's public. Uh, so it's a big deal. What kind of feeling do you have inside 
um, what, when you know that it's public and how much did being in rehab help you out? Yeah, I, I think I was, it was my wife who said, I, I, when we first talked about treatment that morning and when we, we, we went to bed and we got up again and my wife was worried that um, I was maybe going to renege on my promise to get help. And she found me at the computer uh, downstairs up before her searching out treatment centers across the country. And she was like, are you, are you, are you still thinking about getting help? I said, that's what I'm doing right now. And she was obviously overwhelmed with gratefulness because she thought maybe I'd slept it off and then, ah, I'm fine. Sure. You know? Like a lot of, a lot <laughs> of us was, do. Exactly. That, that was my line for years when she would say, if you had too much to drink, I'm fine. Le- you know, leave me alone. And, and, um, or I'll be okay. And this time I was like, Nope, I somehow I had that moment of surrender and I stuck with it. And <clears throat> she suggested inpatient treatment. I was thinking maybe outpatient treatment, like I could do this before I talked to, um, had uh, the breakfast with uh, my, my friend, Ron majors. I, I, I thought maybe I could just keep working and kind of quietly do outpatient treatment in the morning. And she said, why don't you take 30 days to yourself Yeah, and just, you know, almost like you deserve this. You've worked hard. You've provided to, for us. You haven't been a bad father. You haven't been a bad husband. You've just been, you've been changing over the last couple of years, possibly because of this drinking, but maybe go find yourself and do yourself a favor and close yourself into a treatment center away from the public for the first time in your adult life. And I was like, you know, you're right. So I was <clears throat> not sure how they were going to help me. I was more worried about what are they going to do? I mean, is there some magic pill? Are they going to yeah. like put me in a trance or that, you know, and I, I, I wasn't so much worried about work stuff after I calmed down. Like you're right. What, what's a month, a uh, month will, you know, this will be all sort of history once I'm done with it. And people will forget that I was gone for a month. The public will forget. And my colleagues will forget. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll know I went to treatment and it won't be any, any big deal. I was more worried about when I pulled into Hazelin with my family, my kids in the back, and, you know, we were talking, going up. Yeah, what would you tell your kids? Thing. You know, I said when – well, I, I told them, I said, we sat them down before we got in the car and said, here's what's going to happen. You're going to drive up with uh, mom and dad, me and, and, and your mother <clears throat> to uh, Hazelin, and we're going to take a road trip, and you're going to drop me off. And they were like, are you sure you need this, Dad? Are you sure? I mean, I, I you know, it's, we don't – like I said, we haven't I, – I don't think we've seen you – any more than tipsy at, at, you know, at a birthday party before. And I said, I, I know that's, that's why I said, I, I hit it very well, but you know, your mom and I know that, that I, I've got an issue and I need to, I need to address it. So I feel like I really need this for myself. And I'm like, okay, they're, so they were supportive. They were okay. I was worried about them with high school and grade school. I think they might've been a freshman and junior or a freshman and senior. Um, uh, maybe a freshman and junior, you know, at, at the Evanston high school. And I, I was worried about, how kids would treat them when they hit the papers that their dad was a drunk uh, or recovering alcoholic. <clears throat> and there was some of that that they got, but they got a lot of, a lot of love as well. And I think they handle it very well. Um, so I was worried about them. I was worried about going to treatment, what they were going to tell me or teach me. Would I be able to stop wanting to drink? And by the time I got to Hazelden, I had not had a drop for two and a half days. So I knew I could, stop. Yeah. But I didn't know if I could continue to stop and how they would do that. So I said, when I pulled into the parking lot at Hazelwood, I said, you know, I don't know how they're going to get dad to not want to have a glass of wine tonight at seven o'clock at night, but here goes nothing. <laughs> so I grab my bag and I give them hugs and kisses and uh, they're crying kind of tears of like, Oh, this is great, but this is sad. I'm like, don't cry. I, I, you know, I'll figure this out. And I went to treatment and, uh, <clears throat> I didn't talk to them for several days because that was kind of the rules of Hazelin. Yeah, that's how but, I went uh, to a place called Karen. It was the same way. And that's kind of why I ask. Yeah. Because you're kind of yeah. cut off in the best way possible. And, Absolutely. Yeah, and, 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 you know, I was not high profile. Uh, you were and are, and that must have been a great place to go to just clear your head for, for a little bit. And this is just my experience. And you really do. Things start to change. I started to become vulnerable. I'm a 12 step guy too, AA meetings all the way. And I started to share in those 12 step environments and I started to feel good. And I realized, right. okay, this is, this is going to work. So by the time I, 
brought my head up, you know, and you, like it says in our literature, you, you open the hatch and you come up. Uh, I, I did feel like, okay, I can face some things here. Uh, I, I'm, right. I'm because, because what I'm doing is right. And I know I can, if this, if I keep working it and this feeling continues, I can, I can get through anything or I should be able to. Yeah. When, when I, <clears throat> when I got to Hazelin and remember I, I had worked in Minneapolis, uh, TV for about seven years between 1980, uh, let me think here, seven and 19, 1993 before I got to Chicago. Hazelin is only about 40 minutes out of Minneapolis. So when I arrived at my house in Hazelin, <clears throat> up on the bulletin board was an article about me already. <sighs> somebody, somebody had posted because the Minneapolis Star Tribune, uh, one of the columnists had gotten wind that I was going to treatment in Hazelin because I had told people I was going to Hazelin. So you get to Hazelin and there's an article about you on the bulletin board? On the bulletin board. That, that, Talk about humility. This guy, right, exactly. That this guy's coming to treatment in, at Hazelin and somebody – in the house because we used to get newspapers uh, delivered to the uh, to the treatment house, and somebody cut it out and put it on the bulletin board, basically saying this guy's coming to our house, guys. Uh, FYI, and I don't know why they put it on the bulletin board. I don't know if it was like uh, I, I don't know why a fellow house member would do that. Well, we're we are I talking was, about I, the first thirty days of sobriety, right? It's not exactly the metal board of health yet. So <laughs> you know, right. somebody right. gets that, and, who and, knows? And, and, They're probably breaking your balls right. or whatever. Exactly, and that's what it was. I think I, yeah. I think it was kind of like, uh, oh, we got a celebrity coming in. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Let's see how let's see how he handles this. And so I just I saw it and kind of ignored it. And then somebody pointed it out, and I said, yeah, I saw it. I don't, I, you know, I am who I am, guys. And uh, you know, and when it was time to tell them my story, I think they realized I'm not there. I, I think some of them thought, oh, celebrity trying to clean up his, you know, like his image and this and that, and he's not really here for real reasons. I got a little bit of that in the beginning. Like, uh, are you really an alcoholic, or did you do, did you get caught, like, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, driving drunk one night, and now you're trying to pretend like you're, you know, you're you're, you're sobering up and uh, cleaning up your act so you can get back to your TV world? I said, no, I got a big problem, guys. And I explained my story, and they're like, holy shit. Yeah. You're real. You're real. And so then, then all of a sudden, whoever put that article up took the article down. <laughs> so, yeah. So it, so that was that was kind of like a big hello, maybe a little uh, crusty hello. But you know, when you tell your story in these meetings, like you're talking about, and you tell your story to your sponsor if you've got one, or you tell your story in treatment, they know you're legit when you tell the things that happen to you, and. Um, or that are happening to you and the pain inside of you. And you are exactly right. When you start sharing and confiding in other men and women who are also recovering and you listen to what they have to say as they confide in you, it's remarkable how you realize who you are as a sober person, the things that you need to work on and the drinking part kind of becomes not as important as, like I said, the thinking part and the living part. How can I live better and think better? And if you do that, if you live better and think better, the drinking part kind of takes care of itself for me. I kind of, you know, sure, tonight I could, I could uh, sneak downstairs and open a bottle of wine because we still have alcohol in our, our house because my, my kids have a drink now and then. My wife has a drink now and then. They're not alcoholics. But it doesn't, it doesn't concern me that there's alcohol in my house anymore because I have no interest in it. Because I've got other things that I'm working on in my life that are making me feel better about myself, who I am, how I'm recovering. And the last thing I want to do is break my line of sobriety. I've been, I've been sober almost, almost 10 years, nine and a half, nine, three quarters. And I feel good. And so the last thing I'm going to do is have a drink and have to tell my sponsor tomorrow I had a drink and now I'm starting from scratch. Okay. So, so what was it like when you go, you go back to work? Uh, you know, you're 30 oh, days out. You mentioned yeah. that, you know, I, you, you have that 15, 20 seconds. You tell people where you've been, you kind of bring the viewer because uh, part of this business too, you know, I do, I'm anchor in Texas now. Um, you, there's a connection with the viewer, right? Um, and there's yeah. a, there's a real connection you have. And when you open yourself up to people, I would imagine that that was endearing for them. Uh, they already liked you. 
Uh, and so now you're back to work. What, what happens then? I mean, do you keep going to meetings a lot? Are you doing like a 90 and 90, we say like a meeting every day or what's your, what's your recovery like around your work? Because for me, if I was going to do anything professionally, I had to put my recovery first. It's still the same way today, even though I'm not, I should be hitting my recovery harder than I am right now, but you get, you get what I'm saying. Right. Exactly. You you know, everybody, everybody in recovery, I think, uh, ebbs and flows with how hard they hit it. And how, you know, sometimes like when, when I'm hitting it way. hard though, Mark, that's when I feel the best, <laughs> you know, for me, right, for exactly, me. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. No, that's so true. And I'll, I'll tell you the, the difficult part about when I came back to work after treatment, colleagues and everybody were appeared, at least in my face, <clears throat> most of them were very positive. I had, I had to make as, as anybody that works a 12 step program knows at some point in the 12 steps, you are working to make amends to those that you feel like you've wronged during your drinking years. And there were a couple of colleagues uh, at work that I felt I needed to make amends to. And I will tell you that I was so green in recovery and kind of so unsure of myself. I wasn't drinking. I was going to some meetings. I was looking for a sponsor. I didn't have one yet. And I was probably going to I would say maybe four meetings a week. I had a very hard work schedule. Sometimes my days were 13, 14 hours long. Sometimes they were only eight hours long or nine hours long. Four meetings is pretty good. Hard to, in my, for me, that? four meetings is pretty good. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Early on. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and now, you know, now with zoom, I, I can get to, I can get to three meetings a week fairly easily with zoom. I can go in person. I can, I can do a couple of zoom meetings and, you know, and, but yeah, four meetings is actually sometimes difficult. Even in even in a retired busy life like mine right now, <laughs> yeah. Point, point being, I was trying to think about okay, I'm going to meetings and now I have to talk. I'm looking for a sponsor, but I'm talking to my counselor at Hazelin in Chicago because they have a satellite office in Chicago, and I'm talking about how to make some amends. And I probably tried to make some amends to, and amends equals for those that are not in the in the program, the AA program, it's kind of an apology to somebody that you would like to make amends to uh, or apology to for your, for your treatment of them during your drinking years. And so I, I pulled a couple of colleagues aside that I felt like I wanted to make amends to, and it didn't go very well. They weren't very receptive. They were kind of like, they gave me a blank stare. Like, um, I still think you're a jerk. Huh. And I went back to my counselor and went like, what's that all about? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm trying really hard here. And my, my counselor basically said, doesn't matter. They can act any way, they can react any way they want. It's not about their reaction. It's about you making the furtive effort <clears throat> to make an amends, to make an apology to them about your behavior, your past behavior, and you let it be there. Just let it be. Whatever their response, whatever their response is, is their business, not yours. You're not there to get hugs and love. You're there to just say it and let them have the opportunity to say something if they want and walk away. And that was a big learning curve for me. Like, wow, not everybody thinks I'm a hero for going to treatment and admitting that I had a problem. Yeah. You know, some people are like, I still think you're a jerk. <laughs> and, or you acted like a jerk. Wait, you know? What was, and, when you acted like a jerk, what, did you have some, like, some ego stuff? Oh, at, where, yeah, where maybe yeah, you, yeah, you like, talk like down to people or, you know. Right. Yeah, I would lose my temper at work or, or here's an example. Uh, one particular colleague who was kind of in charge of my newscast and I would work closely with this person. I would not have the balls when I was drinking to confront this person if I felt like the newscast didn't go well and I felt like there was fault to be laid on this person or some of the people that this person was in charge of behind the scenes. So what I would do is I would mull it over and I would go home and I would go down to my office, my drinking office, and I would start firing off emails to this person late at night, itemizing what went wrong in the newscast and how we need to be better and how I feel like this person wasn't doing the job properly. Well, I was one bottle in yeah. while I was doing it. And, and then the next day I would get this cold look like, how come you didn't tell me this right after the newscast? How come yeah. you had to go home and email me? And that was gutless on, on my part. And I did this a number of times and we just kind of ignored each other and, and tolerated each other. And then when it's time for me to make amends and apologize, this person wasn't over it yet. 
Yeah. And this person actually, this person actually ran into a colleague's office when I announced I was going to treatment and said, I knew it. I knew he had a drinking problem because I was getting these late night emails. <laughs> yeah. And, and this person was right. And all the right in the world to say that to the other colleague and all the right in the world to, to still be mad at me because, uh, you know, I was just being a jerk. And so I'm not even sure that this person ever forgave me, but that's okay. As I learned later in my treatment program, in my program, but I was so green leaving treatment and going back to work that, you know, everybody and their brother knew that I'd gone to treatment. So I was getting Facebook and, and Twitter messages and emails from people that needed help or people that had a relative or a husband or a wife that needed help. And how, what advice did I have for them? And I was probably dispensing advice that was no good. And there's no playbook I, for that though, right, Mark? I mean, literally no, you come right. out of, you come out of treatment as a public guy and all you can do is continue to try to work some sort of recovery program, stay sober and be, and be present, you know, because that's, that's hard. We all get that, whether you want to call it a pink cloud or whether the pink cloud lasts forever, right. or, you know, I, I, you know, you feel, sometimes you feel 10 feet tall and bulletproof when you get sober and you want to tell everybody, or, or maybe you don't, but it's oh, hard. It's right. hard. And right. as long as I had yeah. some, some rough stuff too, but I'm, you know, none of it was even as close to as bad as the damage or the stuff I did uh, willy nilly when I was drinking. So that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yes, exactly. You, you nailed it on the head. You know, after, after kind of getting my feet on the ground after treatment and going back to work and answering some of these emails and, 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 and you know, I felt like I was helping some people out that were asking for some advice, but again, I probably wasn't giving great advice. I just didn't really know enough about what I was doing yet even though I was not drinking um, and I was going to meetings. Uh, but I did feel 10 feet tall. I did feel like I've accomplished something and I was on that pink cloud for a while, but I was finding out by going to enough meetings that I had a lot to learn. I had a lot to learn about myself still. I had a lot to learn about how the program works, how to work the 12 steps properly. I still hadn't found a sponsor and I was searching for a sponsor. Maybe I was being too picky. And I was also still in the public eye and people were looking at me like, you know, even on the street, Hey, you're the guy that just went to treatment. Hey, you're the guy that went, you know, you're the recovering alcoholic. And that was kind of new to me to say, yes, I'm an alcoholic and I'm a recovering alcoholic. So I didn't necessarily know how to, you know, inside I would handle it. I think, you know, as politely as I could, but inside it was still difficult. Like, Ooh, you know, when we go to dinner with friends, what are we going to do? Yeah. Do I, you know, and, and the first couple of dinners with my neighborhood friends, some of whom I would drink and have cigars with uh, in the backyard, they didn't want to drink around me when we were going to dinner. I was, and I finally put the kibosh to that and said to my wife, please tell people, anybody that wants to go to dinner with us, they must insist on drinking the way they want to drink. Because it's too uncomfortable having everybody sit around, twiddle their fingers, drinking water at dinner when they don't normally do that. And they're not alcoholic. It's not going to make me want to drink to have them drink. And it's going to make the dinner, my friendship with them uncomfortable. So let them be what they want to be. And my wife was like, that's a really good point. I will tell them. And then from then on, every time we went to dinner, you know, no, nobody would get trashed in front of me. And I'm sure sometimes, you know, if I was drinking back in the day with them, we probably would get a little trashed. So they were polite about it, but everybody would have their wine or have their martini or do whatever. And it was, I, I learned quickly. It was fine. It was okay. It didn't bother me. It didn't, didn't, didn't compel me. Didn't worry me that I, oh, there's a drink eight, you know, five feet from me. I'm good. Well, then fact, the, the first thing I did out, and the more the more the you, thing I did out of treatment was ask ask my wife to take me to a ball game because I used to love to I uh -huh. still love to go to ball games. So we went up to a Brewers Cubs game up in Miller Park. Uh, right after treatment, she's like, "Are you sure? There's a lot of drinking up there, <laughs> yeah. and you did a lot of drinking up there." I said, "I want to get back on the horse without drinking and see what it's like." And you know, it wasn't easy the first time somebody was passing a beer between me and this and that, but within about two hours, hour, I was absolutely okay. Yeah. I realized it's just not for me anymore and people can do what they want to do. And I kind of realized then I could still have fun and not drink. Yeah. And, and you know, you're hanging with your wife and that's somebody who you obviously have a strong connection with and you're reestablishing that connection. But you mentioned hanging out with friends, you know, and how much they're going to drink when you stay sober long enough, like you have, 
you realize that anybody you hung out with that was just getting trashed when you were hanging out with them, they just kind of fall off. Doesn't mean there's anything wrong with them or whatever, but right. you find yourself hanging out with savory characters, people you find interesting without the alcohol, and it all it all kind of works itself out. That's that's a vision that I didn't didn't understand when I first got got sober. A couple more things. I've taken you over the hour, but this is uh quite quite compelling. You mentioned being around groups of people. You're a very social guy. I got a buddy who I grew up with who just just stopped drinking and he's a bartender. And you know, he's still doing wow. he's still doing that and he's he's going to meetings, he's, meetings he has a sponsor, but how did you stay sober? Like what were your coping mechanisms for people that basically are, you know, whether they work in a line where they're going to be around alcohol or there's somebody like you who's going to end up, you know, going to cocktail parties or whatever, you know, soon after they get sober. How do you tell them to cope? What are some coping mechanisms and what are some ways to get through it? That's an excellent question because it, it is not easy. It's not, I was thankful that in treatment, uh, my 30 days of treatment, my compulsion to need or think I needed a drink went away. Uh, so I, I, I had that spiritual moment where, Hey, I don't really feel I'm not, you know, there's no shaking. There's no, Oh my gosh, I really need something. Oh my gosh. Uh, geez. And once I got out of treatment uh, and, and was on my own, it was scary at first. Like, okay, am I going to think that cocktail hour is going to be the time? What, what am I going to do? And I was lucky that it did, those moments didn't overwhelm me. However, you are correct. You need coping mechanisms or you need, you need a sort of a, a, a schedule and plan in your mind. And so I found that over time, and it took me a little while, in my sobriety to kind of, and it, it changes periodically, you know, like different coping ways. For example, like on weekends, like when I would come home on a, a Friday night, which was a big party night for me, even mm -hmm. if my wife wasn't up or if she was up, that was my, that was my ticket to drink on a Friday night. If she was up like, Hey, honey, let's have a drink. And you know, I didn't have to hide it then. My, my ticket was basically, okay, I'm going to have, I'm going to allow myself something sweet like chocolate ice cream yeah. <laughs> or, you know, a, 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 a great piece of chocolate candy bar that I love, whatever, and not worry about it. Um, and, and, or even, even like cigars, I, you know, I do enjoy cigars still. And my, my counselor in Hazel said, if you find that when you light up a cigar, if you feel like in the other hand, you need a drink, then you probably shouldn't be smoking a cigar. But, but our research shows that usually you don't need that. Your cigar will be fine. A cigarette will be fine. I wasn't a cigarette smoker, but I was a cigar smoker. And so that was another coping mechanism. That it was like, I could still go out and have a cigar and sit and enjoy and relax and, and, and quiet my mind um, without a drink in my hand, having a cigar. That was another small coping mechanism for me. Um, certainly, I wasn't going to rely on that because if I'm smoking cigars 24-7, that's <laughs> not healthy. Yeah. But what I, what I would basically do is, at, let's say on a Saturday night at six o'clock, which was kind of like my, another cocktail hour time when my wife and I were preparing dinner together, that was a good, great time for me to either start a martini or, or open up a bottle of wine for both of us. I would find ways to keep myself somewhat busy. Now I would say, for example, on, can I chop up some veggies for the salad? Can I, can I, what can I do to keep my hands and my mind kind of busy? Or should I set the table? Or should I build a fire in the fireplace? You know, and I would say it out loud. And it would kind of allow that hour or so, or hour and a half, to pass yeah. where my mind, I would relax. And it sounds simple, like, well, just keep yourself busy and you won't think about drinking. Well, I kind of had to do that. And I also, for example, let's say she would say, we're going to my good friend so-and-so's Christmas party. And there's going to be a lot of drinking there, but, you know, not overly drinking, but and I remember the first Christmas party we went to up at some friend's house in the suburbs. And I walked into the house and I could just smell the alcohol. I mean, yeah. it was a packed, packed Christmas party. I was like, oh, boy. And it's not like it was making me want to drink, but it was more like it kind of turned my stomach like, ooh, it smells like sour alcohol in here. So I went into that thing with a plan. And I said to my wife, if I feel like somebody – starts telling me a, a story that they've mentioned twice or three times. In other words, they're getting a little too drunk and I'm hearing the same story twice or three times. Honey, I'm going to leave. I'm going to go, I'm going to politely head out the back door 
and maybe take a ride to the Seven Eleven, grab a grab an ice cream. Sure, yeah, and sure. The parking lot. Yep. Listen to a sports game on the radio, and you text me when you're ready to come have me come pick you up. And I, I and what I would call it is an escape room. I, I needed to plan an escape route for those times when it became a little overwhelming. Not that I needed a drink, but that it was like, you know, it's kind of gross hanging around drunk people. And so those were my coping mechanisms that helped me kind of get through. And I found that every new situation, let's say a new situation was, okay, I've been to a Christmas party. I've been to a baseball game. Uh, another new situation might be like a company party, like at, you know, let's say the boss is throwing a, um, a bash on his boat on the Chicago River. Okay, that's a new situation for me, a new alcohol situation for me. What do I do? Okay, well, I'm going to tell the boss, hey, after an hour or so, if it gets too drunk, I may have you drop me off at the corner of blank and blank along the Chicago River, and I'll take an Uber or taxi back to my car and head out for the night. And just... I would confide in him to drop me off. And that was my exit route. If I was, if I didn't have an exit route and I was on that boat on the river for three hours, suffering miserably with a bunch of drunks who were, you know, getting half naked and jumping into the river, I would be like, I, you know, you might as well shoot me, put a bullet in my head. Well, and I, so I, always, I, I hear you respect, you, know, you respecting, you know, and that's one of the keys for me. We don't ever have this licked. Like respect the monster no. that this is, you know, right. like, like, it so yeah, yep. you can feel a hundred, you feel awesome. You know, you're having a kick ass day. You're laughing. You, the last thing on your mind is drinking. At the, and this is for me at the end of the day, I'm an alcoholic. So at any point in time, Bingo. I can get super jammed up or super uncomfortable or, or just want to kind of get out of a situation where there's intense drinking and to respect that and to think forward, Hey, let me, how am I going to get out of this? That's something that I've been kind of falling I'm, I've been falling short of doing, and it is a great, it's a great reminder talking to you that, that, you know, that is very important, uh, even, even still today. It's so true. And you know, I think in Hazelwood, they, they, they talked about alcohol. And we talk about it in our 12 step meetings too, that alcohol is cunning and baffling, meaning alcohol is always around the corner to an alcoholic, always available to an alcoholic. And it's cunning and baffling because before you even realize that you may be thinking about taking your next drink, you probably have already decided subconsciously that you're going to take another drink. I'm not there and I'm not there yet. And it hasn't happened to me in nine and a half years, but it's possible. Yeah. And in, in Hazel, Hazel, they called alcohol slick. Yeah. And slick. Yep. Slick is the name of alcohol and it sits on your shoulder. It's kind of like that old animal house movie about, are you going to do her? Like the, devil <laughs> the angel the devil. Right yeah. Side. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. Whereas the angel saying, now, come on, be a good boy. Don't, you know, don't, don't, don't be a bad boy to this, this young lady that you're meeting here. And the devil's on the other side. Going, come on. What's it going to hurt? <laughs> and slick is the devil saying, come on, what's one drink. And as we all know, in this plan of recovery, this 12 step program that, that I'm working, that you're working one drink, they say leads to, worse abuse of alcohol than the last time you stopped drinking. And I've heard so many stories over the years from guys that have been sober 35 or 40 years that somehow took another drink because they thought they had it lit and they were worse off than they were 40 years before that because the body and the mind never ever stop in an alcoholic, have a mechanism to stop drinking once you start again. And I fear that that's my greatest fear. So I'm staying away from my alcohol, from alcohol by working my program and doing exactly what you said, respecting it. You know, uh, the first guy I ever heard called Slick, I heard uh, Joe Namath was talking about sobriety on the Howard Stern show. And he mentioned that he called his alcoholism Slick, you know, like uh, Slick yeah. is the voice there in his go. head that tells him the bottle of wine in the hotel room looks good. You know, it's, it's right. like, or you, yep. you walk by, but it's, it, it is, it's kind of that, that disease voice. All right. Two more things. One, your, is your daughter a, a musician full-time? Yes. Uh, she's a full-time uh, songwriter in Nashville for Warner Chapel Music. Yeah. So she sings She sings a lot of the songs that she writes, either uh, that she's written alone or written with other people. She sings them at um, various things called Writer's Rounds in Nashville, which are these great events where you go to a, a, a bar or a venue where 
uh, great writers in Nashville will get together and say, I wrote this for Garth Brooks, or I wrote this for this. So she's written a couple of songs, one for Carrie Underwood that uh, Carrie Underwood's uh, uh, considering right now. Uh, she wrote another one that uh, Keith Urban cut that uh, he hasn't put on an album yet, but he, he likes and has recorded. So, yeah, she's she's a songwriter in Nashville and uh, loving every minute of it. She wrote a song about you and your sobriety. and she and, did. and to me, that showed how talented she was and just kind of the, the, the artist side of her or, or that lives in you. What was called the finish line? What was that like for you? Yeah. I mean, she just she talked about she talked about some of your coping skills, and she just talked about right. you could just feel the love she had for you and the respect she had watching you yeah. go go through it on the other side. Uh, how how did that it, feel? It it, it was it, I didn't know she was writing it, um, and uh, and I think I believe she wrote it early on in, in college. She went to Berkeley College of Music in Boston and. She left me a voicemail and said, Dad, I'm going to send you something. I wrote this song, and, uh, and, a, and a couple of her uh, classmates sang it with her, kind of a, in, in sort of duet trio type thing. And when I heard the song, I couldn't stop sobbing because I, I realized that even as a young person, she kind of understood me, mm -hmm. understood it, and understood what I had gone through or at least tried to, tried to work through and understood my – understood her dad on the other side on the sober side too and it was one of the greatest gifts that i've ever had that 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 your your kid can understand and and sing and write a heart-wrenching but loving song and uh, yeah the finish line is is a beautiful beautiful thing and uh, i haven't listened to it in a couple of years but there was a time when i was listening to it like once a month just to kind of Keep me, keep myself powering through and knowing that I was doing this for myself because you have to be you have to get sober for yourself and then you then you are sober for your loved ones. You can't say I'm going to get sober because my daughter and my son and my wife want me to. You have to get sober for because Mark wants himself to be sober, and then the rest will follow. And so it was a beautiful thing to have my daughter realize that I was in a better place when she wrote that song. So it was. It was just fantastic. And she kept the voicemail that I left her. I called her back and I was just sobbing on the phone about listening to it. And she called back and said, dad, that was, that was the response I was hoping that I would get from you. I was hoping you weren't going to be sad or, or mad or, or, you know, whatever. And, and I, I was, I was like heartfelt broken down. Like I cannot believe that you felt and put on paper on musical paper, everything that you said here, because it's just perfect. And it encapsulates everything I went through and everything I'm going through. And I don't, it's not poor me. It's more like it, it, it was empowering to me. And it was just a beautiful thing. Yeah. Well, great gift. It, thank it, you for, God, thank you for mentioning it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we're going, we're going to throw it up here. I, uh, we'll put it on the link to the podcast because it's super cool. It's a, it's, it's on her, her YouTube page. Last thing I want to ask you, what do you tell somebody that's coming around and is just trying to get a day sober? You know, I, I think the first thing I, I would ask is, um, do you feel that alcohol is, is, um, has uh, made your life unmanageable? And in what ways has it made your life unmanageable? And if they can tell me that there are ways that their life has become unmanageable and they feel that they're an alcoholic or they may be an alcoholic, I would ask them to come to a meeting with me. And if they're not in the same city, I would say, well, want to join me on a, a meeting, a Zoom meeting, because I've got a number of good ones where there's some good sober years of some men or women or both, a co-ed one or, or an all men's one, uh, and join me. And just see if you hear anything in this meeting that rings a bell. And uh, that's how you start, because that's how I started. And then I would tell them my story. And that's all I can do is tell them my story, offer to take them to a meeting, offer to have them on a meeting, whether it be Zoom or in person, but tell my story and say, you know, what? I'm an alcoholic and here's how I got here. And uh, see if anything that I say rings a bell, because that's how I found fellowship in these meetings and in sobriety is because I listen to other people tell their story about their alcoholism and how they were, got into recovery. And all of a sudden I realized I'm not alone. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that guy, that guy says the same crap that I, that I went through. 
And some things you hear, you don't relate to. Some meetings, even today, I'll, you know, I'll listen to 10 people talk, and, and nine of them might not, not say anything that really rings a bell, but there's a 10th guy there that says, oh, wow. Yeah. You know, so that, that's exactly what I, I went through that this week, that same exact problem. And it wasn't about drinking. It was about my thinking. It was about my defects. It was about how, how I coped and managed with my sober life. And he said the same thing. And, wow, I, there's some fellowship there. I, I was kind of feeling alone that this week, even though I'm nine and a half years sober. So that's what I would tell somebody is that come to a meeting and see if you hear anything that rings a bell that relates to what you're going through. Yeah, hang around hang around until somebody tells your story. I, I, I've heard a guy say that, right. that I'm yeah, tight with. He exactly says that a lot. Right. So you uh, – oh, man. Uh, Old guy also said to me, <clears throat> uh, go to a meeting and take the cotton out of your ears and stick that cotton in your mouth and shut up and see if you hear anything. And that that's kind of a good thing because I, I think a lot I think a lot of so uh, a lot of a lot of people go into meetings scared and then they come out and they want to they want to they want to talk to people and, and, and tell them what's going on and that's good. But I think if you listen and sit and listen to some some veteran sobriety out there, you'll hear something. You you uh you're exactly right, and 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 you, by the way, are, uh, you know, you're one of the inspirations behind this this podcast because I, I, you know, I work as an anchor, and I was kind of like, eh, should I, you know, I'd been sober for a little while, and I really wanted, I I went so deep down the rabbit hole, I really didn't get started as an anchor till I got sober. I didn't, and I I wanted it. Anybody that knew me knew I was sober, but people, the audience didn't, and uh, you know, I kind of came out with it when I was about nine years last year and started this podcast up uh, about a year ago. And it was kind of, you know, I'd, I'd followed your story and I'd, I, it, you helped me um, years ago. And it's just really cool how this, and, and that's recovery, right? I mean, you share your story, you have no idea if the person in the back of the room is paying attention, but oh, by the way, you might see them in 20 years if you're both luckily still sober, hopefully still, and then they'll tell you something you said changed their life. You just don't ever know how it's going to work out. That's exactly right. It's exactly right. And, and that's the beauty of, that's the beauty of what I, I feel Alcoholics Anonymous is all about. It, it, you know, it started with two men and now it's millions in how many different countries. And I've, I've been to AA meetings in various parts of the world when I've traveled and they're all the same. And that's a good thing. And there are things that I've heard in a meeting in Panama, the country of in um, uh, Japan, uh, Thailand, uh, and here in the States in different, different parts of the States that I still remember. And I have no idea where those men or women are these days. Some of the things that they said still stick with me. And, you hear, you, like you said, you keep going to meetings, you're going to hear something about yourself. You're going to hear something you relate to, and you're going to hear something inspirational that's really going to help you. Well, I've made a decision for you. This is the biggest story of your life, what you're doing right now. Uh, you know, I asked you at the outset what the biggest story was. It just yeah. crossed my mind. This this is the biggest story of your life. You know, you continue to it's tell true. it. Yeah, and you're doing an amazing thing. A anything else you want to share? Well, I just appreciate you being as open as you are about this disease because it is a disease. Um, it, it's not, it's not our, our, our will like, yeah, come on, you can do this. No, it's not. It, 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 there's no white knuckling here. It's a disease that we have to accept, surrender to, understand to get sober. And you're doing great things by putting this kind of message on a podcast. If it helps one person out there who listens, it's completely worth it. Mark, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, man. Take care, Mark. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for listening to The Payoff with Pete. Once again, I'm Pete Souza, And of course, we are part of the Rogue Media Network. All kinds of good podcasts you can find at roguemedianetwork.com. And of course, you can find this podcast and all those other ones wherever you get your podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, other spots like that. This has been a Rogue Media Network production.